<laughs> Thanks, <laughs> sweet. Uh, quick question though, did you, um, did you start the recording by any chance? The start broadcast button up at the top? I did, uh, yes. Okay, sweet. Oh, oh that was wow. awesome. <laughs> All right. So let's give him another round of applause and welcome back. Thanks, y'all. Glad to be with you. Um, yeah, so uh, sort of just a little bit about myself. Um, so currently I work for uh, these folks, Mass Relevance. We are located here in Austin, Texas. Um, we either build or power uh, experiences like this year for Major League Baseball or this that you might have seen for, uh, for the last Olympics or uh, President Obama's Twitter town hall. Um, pretty much if you see Twitter appearing on television, then it was probably us that was powering it. In fact, I think we are coming soon to your very own CBC. And uh, some of my previous gigs, um, also all these companies were either uh, located now or at one point in Austin. We also um, have this in common. We are all hiring thoughtful Ruby developers. So if you need a job, then I would recommend that you uh, learn Ruby. And another great reason is, of course, the, uh, the subject of today's talk. And so if you're here, you're off to a great start. Otherwise, you have probably been at it for years, and you just want me to shut up and get on with it. Right out. Here we go. So uh, as, as front-end developers, we, we kind of have a bit of a quandary. And that is that the amount we've needed to know over time in order to consider ourselves competent front-end developers has increased pretty substantially. So uh, back in 1995, right around the time that uh, my Alanis Morissette reference there would have been at all relevant, um, it was pretty much just HTML, right? It was paragraphs, lists, blink tags, you know, all that stuff. You are all set. And then in 1997, we've got CSS and JavaScript. We start thinking about separating our style from our content, making that content dynamic. And then in 2005, the term Ajax is coined and starts giving people headaches. And then in 2007, we have even more headaches with mobile development. And all right, 2013, we've got CSS3, HTML5. It's just a version bump, right? We're all set. Well, let's, let's start to unpack that a little bit. So CSS3 really comprises animation and 2D, 3D transforms and fonts and HTML5, you've got this host of new semantic elements and local storage and video and audio and geolocation and JavaScript is MVC and AMD and really it's just evolved into a series of acronyms at this point. Plus you've got the coffee script and the espresso script and the latte script and you'll probably want to know about this stuff here as well and maybe have a passing familiarity with all of these things and then You've also got these libraries, and before you know it, you're dealing with a tag cloud, right? And as we know, everybody hates tag clouds, right? So hold on to your hats, folks, for this, this even more stunning conclusion. The explosive growth of the web has really dramatically increased the, the complexity of front-end development. And our tools haven't always really kept pace. So how do we start to tackle some of this complexity with a tool that we know well, Ruby? So let's, let's start from the foundations. Markup. So let's take a look at some HTML, some of the how to make a living. So this is a very simple example. And every element, as we know, has an opening and closing tag. So I've got my div here with a paragraph tag inside of it. And let's, let's take a look at a slightly more complex, totally contrived example. So I've got this div with an unordered list and a single list element inside. And it's got this span. But as I, as I look at this, I get concerned. Because do I, do I really need to be closing all of these tags? You know, Computers really ought to be able to figure this out for me. That's robot work. So it's not so much that it's a pain to write. I can configure my editor to close the tags. But it does clutter the document, makes it a touch more difficult to understand the structure if you're looking at a very large, very complex nested file, and just to read things generally. And since we spend most of our time reading code and not writing code, that's important. So one of the first attempts at tackling some of the complexity of markup with Ruby was Markaby. Now this was released in 2006. And if you're fortunate enough to recognize that blog header there, you know it's from our very own Why the Lucky Stiff. If you don't recognize it and you don't know who I'm talking about, 
Google Wise Poignant Guide, get to know him. Um, the, the illustrations I used across this presentation were uh, borrowed from Y. Um, and as a quick aside, here's how dumb I am. I didn't notice until I was putting this talk together that the hands are in the background of the red-handed header there. That's, that's just how dumb I am. Anyhow, so we can see what he's doing here with the, with the Ruby is he's using it to capture and treat his links as strings, and he's appending those together with pipes, and then we get that little 5 gits bits inspect series of links in his header there. So if we take a look at that example from earlier, this is what it's going to look like in Markerbean. So we see each element is a method. We're using blocks to nest elements and our content. Because it's Ruby, um, all of the blocks must be closed, right? So it doesn't really solve the particular problem of closing tags because we're still closing all of these blocks. So Python and other white space significant languages figured this out, right? So Hamel, which was also released in 2006 by uh, Hampton Catlin, and I believe it's maintained now by Nathan Weizenbaum, it added that sig concept of significant white space to the mix. So now I don't have to bother with closing all these tags. The Hamel interpreter just sees the indentation, recognizes the significant white space, and does the rest for me. So it also gives us a shorthand for things like IDs, classes, attributes, does lots of other cool stuff. So you can see up at the top there, I've got the div with an ID of comments. I'm using percent signs to denote uh, new elements. Um, the ul.fancy just means it's a ul with a class of fancy. I, I denote all of my attributes by using a hash there. And I, I don't want to start a religious war. I know that there are a lot of feelings about Hamel on, on both sides, but it's hard to argue that this isn't a much terser, assuming that terser is a word syntax. So an even terser syntax would be slim. Slim is a relatively new entrant onto the scene of Ruby HTML preprocessors, but it started as an experiment to, to see just how much code could be removed from standard HTML. So at first glance, we can see we've lost those uh, percent signs to denote new elements. Um, and really, this is just about the fewest number of keystrokes you can get to produce usable markup. Um, a few differences as well where you're got a different style for denoting our attributes. But really, as we can see, Hamel and then Slim being the, the king of the terseness contest there. And really, these are all great ways to make it easier to comprehend the structure of our documents, to make them more readable, therefore more maintainable, and really just to allow us to write more markup faster. But we're not going to get through things with content alone, we also need to make sure our sites look nice. So good design helps with the success of any project, but sometimes our style sheets can get needlessly complex. So how can we start to simplify our style sheets with Ruby? Let's start by taking a look at uh, some of the problems with our beloved CSS. So if you talk to a neckbeard, uh, a, sorry, a wise learned coder about CSS, they always have some problems with it, right? It, uh, it doesn't do what they think it should. So what are some of those problems? Well, for starters, nesting, right? Why am I saying nav ul and then nav ul li? And I'm styling up a navigation element here. I don't, I don't need to be doing that. Um, and then variables, right? I've got this color red listed twice. What if I want it to be blue? I have to go through and find change for red? That's totally ridiculous. And functions, I don't have functions either, right? So enter SAS, which was given to us by the same folks that created Hamel. They, in fact, built it as Hamel for style sheets. Here we're looking at SCSS, which is SAS's cousin. It's actually now the default in new Rails projects. It allows us to do some really cool stuff. Like, you can see I can nest my selector there. So rather than saying nav ul and nav ul li, I just nest it inside of that ul element. I can also nest my attributes. So rather than font weight, font style, and font size, I nest them there inside of that font block. I can also use variables. So I'll say, well, I want my text color to be red, and then I'll just use that text color variable in a couple of places. Then I can just make that change in one place, and you all know how variables work. I'll, I'll just skip over that. So variables are really where SAS starts to look like CSS from the future. 
Um, so if I've got this uh, callout div and I'm defining some attributes of its border, I can say I want it to have this particular color of green and then my default border width is five, five fixed, but inside of this callout div, I, uh, I want to multiply that default width by two, or I want to apply this darken function to that original color. Um, so then I can set this one kind of base color for a theme, and then by using these darken and lighten functions, I can just change, make one change to that color, and then essentially have reskinned my entire site. Mixins, these are the, the functions of SAS. So here I'm defining this uh, index table mixin. And I'll say for index tables, I want everything in the header row to have a, a bold font, and I'll go ahead and zebra stripe that table. So then for my table with a class of users, I want that to just incorporate all of those styles. Now one project that makes heavy use of the mixin functionality and is built on top of SAS is called Compass. Uh, it refers to itself as a CSS authoring framework. So with Compass, we get a host of CSS3 mixins, layouts, some typography patterns. So let's take a look at some of this. So one of the really basic CSS3 mixins in Compass is border radius. So I've got this class of round in here, and I say uh, include that border radius mixin. Its default border, radi border radius will be 5 pixels, but since that's a mixin, I can actually have arguments and set that to 10 pixels, whatever. And then that's going to get interpreted down to the vendor prefix CSS. And this is actually one of several CSS3 mixins that we get out of the box with Compass. So what's really great about this is we know we're always using the most up-to-date CSS3 declarations. So when things like border radius get adopted by more browsers and we can start dropping vendor prefixes, we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about copy-pasting prefixes all over the place. It's generally just much more readable and more maintainable CSS. Um, so SAS and Compass both offer some niceties for dealing with style sheets, but here's the real problem. What is this? Over time, you're working on a project and you just end up with these huge monolithic files for your style sheets. There's no real organization. Maybe you got some comments, but really it's just selector after selector and, oh, somebody thought to alphabetize them. Great. That makes a lot of sense. So nobody means to do this, right? It's just the sort of thing that happens over time in a project. So how can we start to address some of this complexity? So this comes from a blog post from Chris Epstein called Help My Style Sheets Are a Mess. So here my example is uh, just a, an aside from the, the talk where I, or the conference where I originally gave this talk where the keynote speakers were Matt and Uncle Bob. So I've got my little side element. Um, and then the H2, an unordered list, and but it's not very cool, right? It's just, just, just default, just black and white. So let's, let's make this awesome. Bam, slap some sass on that, and suddenly it's the coolest thing you've ever seen. But really, it's still just a mess of properties. I can alphabetize them, but really, it's not going to help all that much. So I've got all of this, the styles for this aside here. So let's, let's take a look at the typography. So I've got that font family declaration, and then the font weight, and the font size. Well, let's pull that out. Let's create this class highlight text, where I define the font, and it'll say what the, the size and the weight 